<laughs> you know, it has always been my desire and my prayer to the Lord that when I open the Word of God, that He speaks to me. And I trust that when you are doing your Bible reading, uh, that that's the way you start. Lord, speak to me. Tell me what you need to know. All right, turn to Revelation chapter 10. Would you please? Revelation chapter 10. Now, as we get into chapter 10, you would expect that there would be the blowing of the seventh trumpet because, you know, we've seen the breaking of the seven seals. We've heard six of the seven trumpets. But now we're in a parenthesis, just like the one we had back between the sixth and seventh seals, or the sixth and seventh trumpets. Now, last week we showed that God, through this demonic attack, showed us that the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. That's the problem. Folks, our world does not need reformation. It, and it doesn't need rehabilitation. It doesn't need re-education or reorientation. It needs regeneration. And that word means to restore that which was damaged. And that's exactly what we as human beings started out. We were damaged goods. And through the Lord Jesus Christ, He regenerates us. Paul said, it's not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So regeneration is simply confessing your sins, asking for forgiveness, and a lot of times when I hear people give an invitation, they leave out this next one. Turn from your sins. Repentance, that is a key in salvation. And then receiving the Lord Jesus as your Savior. And as we've been reading through the book of Revelation, in the midst of the devastation in this reading, people will continue to harden their hearts against the gospel of Christ. They will continue their plunge towards hell. They really will. In fact, we saw last week in Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 and 21, but the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they, should, that, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither see nor hear nor walk. And then verse 21, and they did not repent. They did not repent. That's why we should do everything that we can within our power to reach people for the gospel. No sacrifice is too great. No distance is too far. No expense or any effort wasted in reaching people for the Lord Jesus. Now here in Revelation 10, we have an interlude between these judgments. I guess it's just a pause. Let's take a breath kind of idea. It's given to remind us that even in the midst of the most horrible period of time that this world will ever see, when it seems that right is on trial and wrong is on the throne, when it seems that evil has finally drowned the forces of good, when it seems that Satan and all of his demons have taken full and total control of the world, when it seems that this world has become a runaway train headed for destruction, this chapter reminds us God's still on the throne. His hand's still on the throttle. And folks, he is in control, whether we want to understand that or not. Now here, this passage kind of introduces us to the middle of the tribulation period. So let's notice what's taking place on earth as we see the lull or the interlude before this final storm. Revelation chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. And I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow on his head, his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. So John sees a mighty angel, and in his hands he's holding a little scroll. Now, the identity of the angel is not given, but it's evident that he's very powerful. He has a rainbow over his head, his face is like the sun, his legs like pillars of fire. You know, nowhere else in Scripture is that kind of definition of any angel whatsoever. That is a deep definition. And what it has done is led some to conclude that this they're talking about the Lord Jesus. However, 
The word another angel in verse 1, that word another means another of the same kind. <coughs> so that's not the Lord Jesus, because the Lord Jesus is unique. He's by himself. It's not another of the same kind. So it probably is not Jesus. It's led others to conclude it may be Michael or it may be Gabriel. The way he's described shows that this angel comes directly from the presence of God. Now we can't be sure who this angel is, but I can tell you this. He's on a divine mission with divine authority. He has all the authority he needs. Verse 2 says, he had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. He holds this little book, which was opened in chapter 5 by the Lord Jesus himself. The title deed to planet earth. And it says this angel stands with one foot on the land and one foot on the sea. So, this is a, an announcement for the whole world. In other words, that's what he's saying. The sea and the land, he's there to tell, let everybody know what's about to happen. And then it says, it calls out the result of seven thunders. Verse 3 says, And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them down. It's interesting. God tells John not to reveal what he has just heard. Don't tell anybody. And whatever message was contained in the voice of the seven thunders, John is not going to put it down. And that's an important <coughs> reminder for us, folks. It really is. God alone knows everything that's happening. He's the only one. And God wants us to know that regardless of how dark the hour is, how big the devil is, how the crowd might do, God's still on the throne. He's still in control. So in the midst of his wrath, we desperately need to be reminded of his power. We really do. The greatest problem with this world is that it leaves Jesus out of its plans altogether. They've replaced him with the United Nations and with the World Economic Forum and with the Federal Reserve and with the FDA and with the CDC, with an inept Congress, a delusional administration, and all of these other faulty man-made institutions. They've substituted all of that for the Word of God. And the result as we look around, it's total chaos. It's awful. But when Jesus is restored as the focal point of history and humanity, things will make sense. We'll understand it. What's that song say? We'll understand it all better by and by. But you know that works in our own lives too. Didn't Jesus say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? And then I'll take care of the rest of these things. I'll push, I'll pull, I'll add, I'll subtract. Let me do it. Don't you do it. Because you know what? When we do it, we mess up. We really do. Now, this is going to hurt some people's feelings. So take a deep breath. Any, any cupcakes in here? Take a deep breath. We are not meant to know all things. Did y'all hear that? We just don't know. Now, come on, Pastor, tell us what the, th seven, what the angels of seven thunders say. I don't know. It says. He wrote it up. He sealed it up. I don't know, neither does anybody else. I mean, we just don't know. But one day, it'll all make sense. It really will. Paul said, for now we see through the glass darkly, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but, but then we will know even as we are known. Answer. <laughs> Look, long. Okay. You know, folks, there are just some things in life that are going to remain a mystery. One of my favorite verses is Deuteronomy 29 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and our children, that we may do all the words according to the law. So, what the Bible is saying is if the Lord doesn't want us to know it, we're not going to know it. It's, it's, it, I, and folks, it's that easy. There are thousands of questions which we just don't have the answers to. Why do good people suffer? 
Why do babies get sick and die? Why is there so much evil in this world? Why? Here's the one that really gets Why is it so hard to live a holy life? We may never have the answers this side of glory, I tell you that. But the best thing we can do is leave the mysteries with the Lord and trust Him to do what's right. Paul said, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. It's interesting also that Paul said that God is restraining the influence of evil in our lives, which is amazing. Second Thessalonians, Paul said, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until there is a falling away and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. So according to God's timetable, the day of the Lord and the accompanying judgment that's going to come won't start until these two things happen. Number one, a global rebellion of faith occurs. And number two, the Antichrist is revealed. Now, somebody asked me, well actually it was Rochelle, so, <laughs> honey, um, is the Antichrist alive now? Is he? <laughs> Perfectly. I don't know. I, I have no idea. But I know what? If he isn't, he's, he's missing a real good opportunity, I'll tell you that. See, the Holy Spirit is the one that's keeping evil in check. Paul said, now we know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawless, lawlessness is already at work. And then only he who restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. <sighs> Boy, I'm looking for that day. The restrainer is none other than the Holy Spirit. And he works through us as believers. Besides, the Holy Spirit's the only one who has the su uh, sufficient supernatural power to hold sin back. He works through the believers to accomplish this. Folks, the church indwelt by the Spirit of God has always been part of holding back iniquity and sin. And you know what we're seeing now? The church is in full retreat. It is in full retreat. Jesus said, when he has come, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. Let me ask you this, as a believer, has the Lord convicted you of sin, and of righteousness, and judgment? I know for me it's every day. I mean, he talks to me all the time. But you know what? At the rapture, we're going to be removed from this earth. We're going to be gone. And the earthly influence of the Holy Spirit will be greatly diminished. Now, he'll still be on the earth. The Holy Spirit will still be here. But his restraining work will no longer be there. He is going to let the lawless activities go. He's going to let them go. When the church leaves the earth at the rapture, I know that this is kind of crude, but all hell is going to break loose. It really is. All the way back in Genesis, God said there will come a time when my spirit will not always strive with men. Well, here it is. Here it is. He'll no longer convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Therefore, because of that, it's the, the lawlessness in this world is going to reach epidemic proportions. So look at verse 5 in chapter 10. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and all things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be no, or there should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servants, the prophets. Folks, the angel brings a crystal clear message. And he tells John that the days of waiting are finished. God says, I'm done. I'm not allowing anything else to go on. He's, <clears throat> he's preparing to bring his work of judgment and redemption to an end. Now, 
in case anybody here has forgotten, God doesn't operate on our timetable. He really doesn't. His timetable is vastly different than ours. We think we're in a period of delay. Remember what the scripture says? Where is the promise of his coming? For all things remain like they were. I mean, nothing has changed. We think God's maybe never going to fulfill all the promises that he made. Well, you know what? We're wrong. We are wrong. God has a different timepiece than we do. Peter said, Beloved, don't, be, don't forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And don't take, don't take that passage of Scripture and run with it. I've heard people say, oh, well, let's see, one day is a thousand years, a thousand years a day. Okay, let's go back to Genesis. So in first day is a thousand years, and second day, no, 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 don't go there. Please don't, don't eisegesis, and that's a Greek word that means you're taking it out, you're using a verse to, to do your own thing. No, that's not what it means. We'll talk about that at a different time. You see, it appears that Satan and sin are winning the battle. But the truth is so much different. It is so different. God's merciful restriction of evil and His loving hindrance of judgment is going to end. It is. Look at verse 8. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it, eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. So then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in his mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. Now, John's told to take, uh, to take the little book from the angel. He's told to eat it, but it's going to be sweet in his mouth. It's going to be bitter when it gets into his stomach. So what's he talking about there? It's the strangest little passage of Scripture. It really is. But it does, however, teach us some wonderful lessons about the Word of God that we really need to hear. This is something very special about this book. It's a one of a kind. The only book of its kind. The Word of God is what we need to hear today. It's food for the hungry soul. It is ointment for the hurting soul. It is meat for the growing soul. Folks, the Bible is such... Great spiritual food. Listen, Jeremiah. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And your word was unto me, and the joy of rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Job said, I have esteemed thy words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Peter said, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Folks, if we're ever going to be all that God wants us to be, we need to get into this book daily. We need to feed. We need to linger there. We need to graze on those things and drink deeply from the word of God. Take notes. When you're studying the Word, I've said this many times, if you're reading your Word, have a notepad next to you. And when you see something that you have a question about, write it down, but keep on reading. Because a lot of times what Satan will do is he'll get, you, he'll get your mind off of what you're supposed to be reading into something that you saw a word and you thought. It's like this Jack Russell. You know, oh, you're off on another tangent somewhere. No, use a note. Use a notepad. Boy, that will really help you. To grow strong in the Lord. He tells us that. We've got to get into the Bible every single day. So I guess the question is, are you feeding on the Word of God? Because you know what? You are what you eat. You really are. When John swallowed that book, he found that it was both a blessing and a burden. It was sweet and it was bitter at the same time. Now, let me give you those two. The sweetness of this book, when it talks about grace, when it talks about love, and it talks about the mercy of God, when we read that Jesus died for our sins and, and was raised from the dead, folks, that's sweet. 
It really is. When we read of heaven, ha, that is so sweet. When we read that he will meet our needs, he will never leave us and one day take us home. How sweet can that be? When the sinner reads that Jesus will save him if he would only come to him by faith, that is sweeter than words can describe, really. So it's filled with sweetness, but it's also a book filled with bitterness. It really is. It tells us about hell and that awaits those who are lost. It's a book that the Spirit of God used to convict the hearts, not only of the saints, but of the sinners. It tells of judgment. It tells of wrath. It tells of damnation. You know, sometimes when I read the Word of God, I get so excited. I really do, and I've told you this many times. I come running up the steps to tell Rochelle how the wonderful thing I just, just found. But you know, there are other times and I'm reading the Word of God and it pierces my heart and I, and I have to go to my knees and say, Lord, forgive me. I, I didn't realize that that was happening in my life. Please, forgive me. You know? So it's, it's a wonderful book of sweetness, but it's also a word of bitterness. If you go all the way back to Revelation 2 and 3, the seven churches, Jesus gave the bitter and the sweet. He said, here's what you need to do, but he also said, Praise you for the good things that you have done. Bitter, sweet. See, when we take the whole book, all of it, the blessings and the burdens, we're able to see how it really does all fit together. It reveals our problems, but it always points us to the right solution. Praise the Lord for the Word of God. I am so thankful for that. But you know what? Of course, we know this today. The Bible has a lot of enemies. Unbelievers will challenge its credibility. Skeptics question its accuracy. The liberals dispute the supernatural character of the Bible. And of course, the cults just twist the meaning. They just, they just go off way out. Folks, this is a powerful book, and the church has got to remain pure in an age of confusion and compromise. We've got to stay pure. This world will follow the spirit of its age, but we follow the spirit of God. This, folks, is the house of God. This is. We are the people of God. This place belongs exclusively to God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we are exclusively under the authority of His Word. So the next time somebody asks you about our church, you can tell them that. By the way, did you invite somebody to church this week? Ooh. Pastor, you're meddling now. <laughs> no, it's just a question. You know, others may not believe what we believe, but we believe. Verse 11 in Revelation 10 says, And he said to me, You must prophesy again about the many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Folks, the word of God has to be shared. It has to be. Now, I'm going to give you a quick understanding of the prophecy after what God told John in this verse. All right? He says, I want you to go prophesy. Here's what he prophesied. He prophesied about the faithful two witnesses in Revelation 11. <coughs> about Satan's vicious persecution of Israel in chapter 12. About Satan's two evil henchmen, the beast and the false prophet, in chapter 13. About the faithful 144,000 in chapter 14. About the assembling of the armies of Armageddon in chapter 16. About the fall of Babylon in chapter 17 and 18. About Jesus' defeat of the nations in chapter 19. About the consignment of unbelievers for all periods of history into the lake of fire. In chapter 20, about the new Jerusalem in chapter 21, and a new heaven in chapter 22. Well, aren't you glad we got through the book of Revelation? <laughs> no, we haven't. <laughs> I'm just saying, that's what he's going to prophesy about all the way through the end of the book. And John is told to share that message with the people. Same burden has been placed on us, folks. Same burden. We're told to take the book with its blessings and its burdens and share it to a lost 
and die in the world. Paul said, How then shall they call on him whom, whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach? And that word means publicly proclaim. Unless they're sent. Folks, we as Christians have been sent. That's our responsibility. He didn't give us his word just for our benefit. He gave us his word to share with this world. This world is going to enter a time of tragedy unlike anything that has ever been seen before. Thank God he's in control. Thank God we have his word. Thank God believers are not going to be here to see the wrath of God that comes upon this earth. Folks, our mission is clear. There is no other time. This is the time. Because time is short. Eternity is forever. Jesus saves. So we need to go out and tell this lost world, we have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves. Amen. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray.